they always asking me, where are you from? When I'm telling them that I'm Syrian. Till I, you're a foreigner, and you say yes, and they say like, go back to your country. It's all you ever, go back where you came from. Go back to China, to Africa. Germany has released a report which reveals that more than 3,500 attacks were carried out on migrants and their homes. Unidentified men have been attacking boats carrying migrants from Turkey to the Greek island. Many have heard that the Turkish authorities have begun deporting refugees and most of them are afraid that they could be next. So when you ask someone or when you're trying to deal with someone as a Syrian, there are some people asking when you will go back to your country. Go back to your Mexican country. Go back to China. To Africa. To all you Arabs. Go back where you came from. Go back to your f***ing country. A firestorm of reactions continuing today to a series of tweets from President Trump targeting a group of Democratic Congresswomen. The president saying they should go back to the broken and crime-infested places from which they came. Here, of course, uh, as an Arabic speaker, I really face um, discrimination. Uh, from time to time, I would see people staring at us uh, if we were speaking Arabic. Like, what do they say? Like, they would uh, come and tell you, go back to your country. Here is Turkey, you speak Turkish with us. I have a lot of friends that are from Syria, and the main problem for them is that they can't find flat, like, they can't find, a ho they can't find housing. Finding a place to live in Denmark can be difficult if your name doesn't sound European enough. A new study has found people with Middle Eastern or exotic sounding names need to handle in 27% more applications to get a response from landlords. And for example, sometimes when I want to rent a home for me or for another relatives, they always ask me, where are you from? When I'm telling them that I'm Syrian, they just stop for a second and after that they are telling me, no, we are not given a foreigners. In Berlin, where 80% of the population live in rented homes, landlords can easily turn down a Muslim woman or a black person. Um, in Turkey, we face this really, really a lot. Well, maybe probably not in Istanbul, but in smaller cities, as soon as uh, they hear that you're kind of broken Turkish, they would say, ah, you're a foreigner, and they would say yes, and they say like, oh, I'm super sorry, but we do not give apartments. They would say it clearly, I mean, this is kind of a strict rule for them that we do not uh, give um, migrants or um, foreigners. Um. Researchers at Harvard University looked into Airbnb renters and those looking to rent, and they found that if you have a black sounding name, you are at a disadvantage. Unfortunately, what we often see is that when these refugees arrive in the new countries, they are not only discriminated, they are also exploited. Being in a very desperate situation, that the Syrians tend to work in very low-paying jobs, and in some cases, they're hired illegally by employers. So then what happens is that the lowest income earners, they're kind of pitted against the Syrians. For example, they enter the informal economy, or they are paid less or even no wages for very physical and demanding labor. So often when we think about racism, we only apply either individual racism, which is person-to-person -person interaction, or institutional racism. Housing policies and education policies, healthcare policies, these are separating migrant people from the local people. And this also creates some psychological borders. And this is how we also create social economic inequality that continues to impact four generations these migrants. So whether someone likes me or not makes no difference if they work for the bank that disproportionately does not approve loans for African Americans right. with high credit scores and high income. Whether someone is kind enough to me at the grocery store and lets me in front of them at Whole Foods or whether or not any of these things does not matter if I can't if I don't get a job because my name sounds too ethnic. And so these are some of the institutional things that we have to account for. Or think about schooling systems. We see a division between white schools and black schools and black schools underperforming significantly compared to these white schools. They are very rarely equal in any way. Black and Latino children are more likely to attend schools with inexperienced teachers, which are then less likely to offer a college prep curriculum. On top of which, because race and class are inextricably linked, those students are six times as likely to be in high poverty school. Segregated schools cause devastating harm to actual children, and not just to their education, but to their very sense of self-worth. Immigrants think that they are not welcomed, then they are less and less investing into their integration process, which means they are less motivated to language, less motivated to stay in the country, less motivated to enter into the labor market, less motivated to achieve in the educational system of the whole societies. So ethnic boundaries are very much important because they are pretty much shaping 
you know, recognition process of the immigrants. But another quite actually a widespread reaction is to pretend that they don't exist. And we see this actually quite a lot in places like Gaziantep, Kilis and Antakya, where there is a large numbers of Syrians living in those cities. And it's sort of like parallel societies, if you will. That Syrians, they live, they organize themselves, and they live side by side uh, with Turks, but with very little interaction. It's very difficult for them to have any kind of meaningful relationship with, with Turks. And they just, they say, well, simply Turks don't talk to us. When you are just trying to enter any country, and you see that they cannot accept you just because you are this nationality. They cannot look at me as a human. Syrians in Turkey were given a temporary protection status under the assumption the war would have ended by now and that they would be able to return home. Under this policy, they are allowed to stay in specific cities or provinces in which they are registered and have access to health care and education. The idea of this to keep the asylum seekers out of the cosmopolitan cities so we don't have to see them. Uh, registering is also like a way to fix people, make them stuck to a place. Then they, may, they become more controllable and they become more manageable for the governments. But officials have stopped registering Syrian refugees in big cities like Istanbul, Ankara or Antalya. So these people have to stay in these small Anatolian cities at the same time. The first interview, as I said, might be coming up in three years. You don't know. This video surveillance footage shows the Turkish police performing random identity checks. It's part of a campaign launched in Istanbul to deport illegal migrants. Istanbul's governor's office has set a deadline of August 20 for Syrians to return to the cities where they are registered. Even to like travel a city which is an hour away from your city, you have to get a, a travel permit from the provincial directorate of migration. Then you can't have access to your rights, so you find alternatives. The interior ministry says it wants to keep the number of unregistered refugees under control and is sending some of them to camps. It also insists Turkey will not become a center for illegal migration. This year, we want to expel around 80,000 undocumented migrants. The country is saturated, and tomorrow, Istanbul could face an uncontrollable situation. The Turkish government denies this campaign only targets Syrians. It says these are precautionary measures to prevent Istanbul from becoming a hub for illegal immigration. Well, I think part of the problem is that in a very short time period, a large numbers of people came in. And I think in terms of social relations, the people were not ready for this. Actually, this is not the first time we see such hate crimes against Syrians or a rise in anti-refugee sentiment. And uh, the, the general sentiment among the public in Turkey is, you know, OK, let's have the refugees in Turkey as long as they're not in our public uh, spaces. Then it became sociologically very difficult for them, so the immediate reaction, I think, became is to just pretend that they don't exist. And then whenever those moments of clash happen, then we see uh, violence. There have already been more than 45 arson attacks on refugee shelters in Germany this year. Asylum shelters are often located far away from town centers, and the crimes are usually committed at night. It is still absolutely possible uh, to do more to protect asylum seekers, to do it in a more coordinated way. And we're talking about people feeling unsafe. And no one should feel unsafe. And that includes our, our amazing and beautiful and productive immigrant community.